Designing for an area like Arizona is completely different. My early practice was in Wisconsin. And when you come to the desert, unlike Wisconsin where you can destroy a bit of the land and it comes back very, very quickly. If you design a building and you destroy the desert, it takes 50 years to recover. So you have to be very gentle on how you build. You know, most architects don't. They just pluck it down and not worry about desert. But you can see this is all natural desert. I built the retaining wall first. By building the retaining wall first, I separated the native desert from the building site. I dug into the hill and just placed it on that. So everything beyond the retaining wall was not tampered with. So I lifted the house up uh, because of the spectacular views. You know, to me, if you live in the desert and you live in this kind of beautiful environment, why don't you um, have a lot of glass? A lot of architects today are building what they call Tuscany. Why would someone come here and imitate Spanish colonial with small people windows? You come to the desert and, and look at the views. I mean, why wouldn't you have a lot of glass? You know, you gotta do certain things, like this glass is all to the south. In the summer, the sun goes like this, so it doesn't hit the glass. In the spring and the fall, it, it slightly hits the glass. In the winter, it, plows into here and the block wall becomes a heat sink. So in the winter, we very rarely have the heat on uh, because the house heats up during the day and it releases the heat through the day. I have the east glass and the west glass, but I have a big overhang and then I also have a sunshade you know, which really protects the, the penetration of the early morning sun in the summer. This whole space up here is one room, okay? The living, dining, and kitchen on the east side. You know, the master bedroom on the west side and, and my library in the middle. This space up here, we filled it <laughs> with books. A great book that I have always next to my chair is The Oxford Companion to Philosophy. You read every single day? Every day. I read two hours serious books. And then I go down to work at seven, and I work till three. I, I think that a house should be built for how a family lives in a house. When I got married to Susanna, there was no reason for us to have children, nor did she want them. So, you know, you don't really need doors. You need doors for the privacy of bathrooms, for instance, when you have parties. But there's only one do uh, real door up here. The bathrooms have sliding panels. I think that we overbuilt. Like when we built this house, I didn't want to do the lower level with a guest house. And Suzanne said, well, why? I want a, I want a guest house for when people come here. And I say, that's why they have hotels. It really does feel like you're just right in the desert. Yeah. We have to come to my library and really see the, to 
to yeah. pure desert. This is pure, unadulterated desert. It's just, I mean, uh, incredible view. Once you're here, you know, you don't stare at it. Huh. You know, you're, aware, you're always aware of the desert. If I'm going to read or I'm going to do some drawings or what, I'm really concentrating on that. But you, you know, your peripheral vision is constantly engaged uh, with what's beyond you. This building was the last cleansing of right in my work, <laughs> okay? When you talk about Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, who had a huge, huge Asian influence in his work. That's what I see. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think Wright was never a 20th century architect, even though he lived in 59 of his years in, in, in the 20th century. I think his work is um, 19th century work. I think it's much more related to a lot of the work that was done in England, and it was more craft-oriented, was crafted, handcrafted. And he didn't embrace technology, even though he always talked of embracing technology. You know, when people would say Frank Lloyd Wright was um, ahead of his time, the fact is, is, we can't be ahead of our time. We can only be in the time that we live. The society might be 25 years back. My father came back from the war, and it was an interesting period of time. The GIs were coming back from Europe and Japan to the United States, and they, they wanted a home, and there was a shortage of homes. So many GIs built their own home. My father, in 1948, I was 10 years old, built a house. So I started building with him. By the time I was 18, I could com completely frame a house and wire a house and plumb it. So by the time I got involved in architecture in 1957, I had built. I swore when I built this house, this was going to be the last building I ever built. And then I built that thing down there. But then I, I had to have a shop. <laughs> so. So I uh, built a shop. So I can build you know, anything I want in there. When I went to work for an architect, you know, I had to make a choice as a young man whether I would sell out and be just a builder, which is 95% of the architects are merely builders. Where does intuition stand, and where does, you know, really rational thought stand? You know, and, and probably architecture is a combination of, you know, the intellectual thought of construction and, but also there's some intuitive things that you do. After this house was built, it was published in some magazine and a guy from Messina, New York called me up and he wanted this house. And I said, I designed a house for your needs, not this is for my and my wife's needs. And when you come to the desert, the idea of building is completely different. 